One of the coolest things about working in the web is that occasionally you get to be in the same room with people who actually um, build the things that impact pretty much everybody. And, uh, and today is one of those, those days. Um, uh, Gil Abaz, uh, I believe you were the founder and CEO of a company called Oingo, right? Co-founder of Oingo. Co-founder, yeah, thank you. Yeah, forget about that other guy. You, you were the founder. Um, a company that created a product I believe was called AdSense, correct? Um, which was acquired by Google maybe like, what, 10 years ago, something like that? Yeah, 2003, yeah. 2003, okay. Um, and after that, uh, I believe in about 2007 or so, you left Google and then started Factual. Um, you're on the board of the XPRIZE Foundation. You started this thing called Common Crawl, I believe, which was a, uh, an open repository of like everything on the internet. Um, you've invested in how many startups? Must be a, must be a hundred now. hundred startups or something. Um, and according to your brother, you have a, um, an incredible reverse jump shot that is driven by engineering. That's, that's nice of him to say. I like to think so. so um, Probably overstated a little bit. So now that I've made everyone here feel incredibly inadequate, yeah. um, uh, I'd like to welcome Gil Abaz, the yeah. CEO of Factual. Um, welcome to Street Fight. Uh, can you, first of all, tell us a little bit about what is Factual? Yeah, thanks for the warm intro. <laughs> a little over the top, uh, but I'm happy, really happy to be here. And, uh, and so Factual, just to explain that Factual is a location data company. So unlike a lot of companies, we're not trying to build the full solution. We have our expertise on the data itself. We wake up every morning completely focused on quality and scale of location data, which is all the places in the world in 52 countries, and increasingly all the people in the world and understanding the consumer journey, device movement. And, and then we're very partnership focused. So we work with a whole range of partners to provide this data that makes it useful and actionable, ad tech platforms, consumer apps, et cetera. Got it. So, so I think um, we'll definitely dive into factual in a second. But I know personally for me, I'm, you know, AdSense is like one of the kind of founding pillars of um, of the early internet, right? Or it, it kind of forced this incredible revolution in publishing um, and in monetization. So I'm kind of curious. Can you give us just a little bit of a um, inside scoop? But how did that get started? Certainly, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, I knew I wanted to build something. And when, in the 90s, post-94, when the web was invented, there were a lot of people talking about search engines. Uh, Oingo was supposed to be a search engine. We built a search engine. Uh, it was based on this massive database, and that was my specialty in my area. Uh, it was based on understanding every word and every meaning, anything that any phrase anybody can utter. Um, and then, well, we failed at being a search. We lost to a couple of big companies like, like Google. Right. Uh, but it turned out that that technology was perfect for matching the exact right ad to a web page. And so it was a, it was a classic pivot. Uh, so did you kind of just stumble on that? You're like, aha, like, I can get someone to click on this and make some money? Uh, exactly. Yeah, we stumbled on it. We were working with partners. Uh, like Overture, seeing how people were trying to monetize websites. Uh, and then the question was, why is it that the ads on most web pages aren't relevant at all? They were all being targeted by demographics, never by context. So we, at the time, we didn't know much about the advertising industry. And repeatedly, we were told context is not how things work. So we got, took a lot of lumps, took a lot of meetings, and people said, no, no, we're not going to partner with you. Uh, a couple years where it was generating zero revenue, 2001, 2002. Uh, finally, early 2003, it just, it just really started taking off. Uh, something that works and makes sense, it may not be accepted right away, but eventually it's going to have its day. And was, was Overture the kind of growth engine? Were they, was, was their distribution the thing that was really powering it? They were, the, they were an early partner that provided the, the back-end supply, the ad network, um, the relationship to hundreds of thousands of advertisers. And our job was the, the publisher, the Got publisher it. side. So, so I've heard a rumor, you can either confirm or deny, that at one point there was an offer on the table to, for Overture to buy you. Um, and to me, the fact that they didn't buy you um, if that's true, um, 
it created a radical shift in this company called Google buying you, which seemed to become the growth engine of Google. So I'm curious, why didn't Overture buy you? I won't get into all the details. We were talking to both companies. So it's companies. true. We were talking to both companies. You know, actually, it was my brother that was the negotiator. I was really the technologist at the time. Got it. Um, now I'm a little bit more front and center. Okay. But there were a lot of discussions, and um, things worked out okay for us, though. Absolutely. So you can't talk about that. Can you tell us? Uh, I've, I've noticed on uh, Facebook you have a relationship with Stormy Daniels. Can you tell us about that at all? Yeah. No. Can't. Okay. 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 I don't know um, even where to go with it. All right. So in, in, um, in 2007 or so, you're like the king of Google, right? You're, like, you're the guy who's helping them print money. Um, and you decide to leave and start a, a local business listings aggregator. Can you tell us why we shouldn't think you were smoking crack to do that? Yeah. So first of all, it, it was just an amazing opportunity, a lucky opportunity, I would say, to get acquired by Google in 2003. They were very much behind the idea of building a Southern California presence very supportive in terms of taking our small team of 45 and growing it in right. order to uh, tackle all sorts of new data challenges. Right. Um, so great, a, great a great opportunity and experience, learning experience for me. Um, at some point, I think two things happened. One is that entrepreneur itch, it itched again. Um, I had to scratch it. I, yep. So I, I knew I wanted to do something again. And then the other thing that clicked was I've always been a data person, but seeing the intensity within Google around collecting information and the ways, the creative ways that they were putting it to use, it made me start to think that the rest of the world is in trouble. There's going to be a few very powerful companies that collect the data. If you look today, you might say Google, Facebook, Amazon. Um, and they're going to start encroaching across all industries and businesses. Uh, why isn't there a neutral company that collects Google quality data and helps everybody else that doesn't happen to be one of those few elite companies. The rest of the Fortune 500, the rest of the world, there's thousands of other businesses that need data. Roll forward to today, people are investing in data science and, and information technology, but they need the data. And that was the opportunity. And so at this point, approximately how many different companies would you say or entities are using your data? It's a lot. So we've been working. We haven't been so loud on marketing, but um, because we're very partnership. Set, but the top five largest companies in the world, the tech tech companies, they all they all use our data. They license it. Twenty eight of the top thirty ad age brand advertisers leverage our data for for advertising. Uh, many of the top financial services firms use it. There's so many. The fun thing is there's so many use cases. It's kind of co right. complicated to talk about. There's so many things you can do with location data. So it but, seems like yeah. you have like three, if I read your site right, you have three primary cases. One is like, okay, here are listings. Two is um, analytics. Um, and three is like this marketing, um, marketing mojo, for lack yeah. of a better word. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the three different... Areas? Yeah, so three major buckets in terms of use cases. So one is building cool apps, you know, Apple Maps and, and, and Facebook and Uber. These companies need location data. Right. Um, marketing is, is one that, well, we know with the shift toward mobile and toward programmatic and toward investments into data, it's been a very, very fast growing opportunity for, for location based ads and to partner to enable a lot of innovation there. Uh, and then the third one, which I think is the most interesting, and we're just getting into it, is analytics and insights. What are all the questions that one can answer if you have a very high quality, very high scale uh, device graph of local observations, people walking into stores and out? Uh, and we're just scratching the surface of that one. Got it. And, and so it seemed like you started with this kind of local listings foundation, but um, in um, various articles I've read about you, you talk a lot about uh, for lack of a better word, like creating this like data graph of the planet, right? That's not just like a business listing, but like you know, you know what socks I'm wearing, right? Um, so how does how does one get from like what's the phone number and address of a pizza place to like what socks I'm wearing? Yeah, so I know it's easy just to say just local listings, but this is really important data. It's hard to build. To do it across 52 countries is a incredibly challenging and fun technical project, but that's just, that's just the beginning. That's foundational, is that we have built global places data. Uh, when you start to layer in technologies to understand device movements, we built our SDK that lives within apps to understand location movement. 
uh, a lot of machine learning around predicting uh, how people are interacting with those 130 million businesses. Are they regulars? Are they just walking by? Are they driving by? Uh, you, you don't want to make mistakes there in terms of uh, making those assessments. So just a ton of technology on top of it in order to build what we call the observation graph. Uh, trillions and trillions of observations across uh, hundreds of millions of devices. Uh, and um, it's, a big, it's, a big, it's a big job. So, so let's go down, down then actually to the mundane stuff. Can you, can you give us a, an example of, so you do a lot with brand advertisers, I think. So what's like a, give us like a, the nuts and bolts of how like, I don't know, Coke or Pepsi or whomever might work with this stuff. Yeah, we had a, can a case study with BMW leveraging, um, leveraging observation graph data to, to crystallize those set of, that, the set of mobile devices that were going to be uh, qualified for a particular campaign. We can do a look back window. Uh, you can do a custom definition of exactly who you want to target. So pick specific car dealerships, competitive car dealerships to do a conquesting campaign. Right. Over, a, over a window, you can specify a frequency of visit. Um, and, then, and then they can run that. They can run that against any of the ad platforms that they prefer, any and all. So, so across would, lots of different inventory so sources. So how would how would like the agency who's running that campaign? How would they actually jack into your data and overlay it over their campaign to use that intelligence? Yeah, so they can work directly with us, but not every brand wants to have a direct data relationship. A lot of times, they just want the convenience of the data already being in the places where they work. So it might be they might be comfortable with a particular demand side platform like a, a tube mogul or a trade desk or double click right. um, the bid manager and, and they want to just see, they want it to be easy just to click on an audience segment uh, or to have us push a custom audience segment just for them. They just click, set up their campaign and move forward. Same thing with the demand, uh, the uh, data management platforms like Oracle DMP and Crux right. and and so in, in the case of the DSP, um, is that the case where you have the relationship with the DSP, not with the brand, really? Or yeah. does the brand have to have a relationship with you to have access to that? I DSP? mean, it's such a complex loom yeah. escape and ecosystem, as we've heard. Um, so we, we definitely have relationships, deep relationships and integrations with the demand platforms. Yep. And it's critical that we work very well together to bring this data to market. We also... Uh, evangelize with the agencies and brands so that they understand the power right. of location data. Got it. So is, is it safe to say, if I looked at the evolution of the company, like you started out with like, oh, we're this pie in the sky, local data thing, we're gonna make this huge thing, it's gonna be amazing. And then you said, wait a minute, there's money in advertising. And you've kind of become like a mobile ad enabler. Is that, is that, say, is that, a, does that boil it down to what you're doing? I mean, it's not the only thing. So maybe, maybe a little more than half of our, our revenues are based on various marketing use cases. Right. In targeting and measurement and insights. Uh, we still have this, this uh, recurring revenue business with, with these major, major businesses in right. tech and in financial services and other. Um, my dream is to do, to do all potential use cases for location. We're looking, we, we're always at bringing on new channel partners to bring our data into new verticals. It just yep. so happens that the marketing one is, is, growing, is sure. growing faster for the reasons I mentioned. Sure. So I actually have a very specific request. So um, uh, if you do any local listings management, you know that um, you want to get your data uploaded to Factual and have it be right. Um, and there are various channels to get in there. One of them is Moz Local. And um, we did a test with Moz Local a few months ago and um, we could never get it updated in factual through them. And they said, there's like a X month waiting list to get stuff um, updated in factual. So is that, is that a case of like you guys deprioritizing like mom and pops uploading stuff or even channel partners uploading stuff? Like what's, what's going on there? Like why is that a, a challenge for you? Yeah, so our, our goal is to have the highest quality location data across all of these countries. There's a lot of automation there a lot of algorithms that automatically figure out quality of data, um, what to highlight or what, what to use right. at what weighting. And a lot of times we're looking for multiple evidence, uh, points of evidence that a business actually exists. Uh, with certain of our, so you mentioned Moz, so they're one of our uh, trusted data contributors, which is a program we instituted where we take a bunch of time to get to know a partner, to vet the quality of their data, 
They certainly passed our test, so high quality data. Right. Um, it does take us some time to vet. Um, once they're vetted, then we ingest their data on a regular basis, and we do builds um, every four weeks usually, sometimes, sometimes eight weeks. Yep. So it should, unless the record didn't get validated because it, it didn't, something looked wrong with the record right. according to our algorithms, I mean, it should, it should get in a build uh, a month or two months later. Um, I'd love to be able to, to speed up that process. Um, it's just that we, we just have so many different feeds of data. It's, sure. it's, hard, it's hard to, uh, to, to improve upon that. But we, I think by the end of the year, I think we'll, we'll, get, it, we'll get it faster. All right. All right. Let's talk about something fun. Um, uh, so you've got this big data thing. You know, you're, you're crazy, brilliant mathematician, whatever. I love the fact that before we got on, you wanted to tell me about the infographic you guys did. Oh, yeah. um, so let's talk about your, your Super Bowl infographic. So one of the fun things with location data is that you, you get to see how consumer patterns change, what consumer patterns are. Uh, and uh, so we started doing these infographics. We launched one this morning about the Super Bowl where we analyzed the affinities and interests of Eagles fans versus Patriot fans. Of course, timely to do that right. this week. Um, and so for example, so you can see it on our, on our homepage if you scroll down to the bottom you can see the link to our, our blog on that. Um, but we noticed that Eagles fans have a much higher affinity for uh, Quaker Steak and Lube, right. which I hadn't even heard of. I guess that makes me not a Philly person. I don't, does, there, does everybody, who's been to Quaker Steak and Lube? There so you it's, go. It's very popular out there. And it, then I learned, I learned yesterday that Quaker Steak and Lube is most known not for steak, but for, for, lube. for, <laughs> for wings for chicken wings, and chicken is also very popular. According to our studies, chicken is also very popular uh, among Eagles fans, whereas Patriots, they had a very high affinity, especially high for Five Guys Burgers, which I am very glad came to LA recently, and I, I do like it a lot. Right, right, right. So, um, and I think when we initially spoke, you said um, you had actually modeled this Super Bowl stuff on something Foursquare had been done. You said, oh, we've got, we, we kicked Foursquare's butt with data. Oh. Like, or, oh, I'm sorry, maybe you said that. Um, can you, like, so what's the difference between you guys and say a Foursquare right now? I wasn't necessarily gonna poke fun, but no, that was something a few months ago yeah. where they had, they had drawn an, a map of 50 states and listed what they called the most popular quick serve restaurant, yeah. fast food restaurant in each state. Right. And we kind of poked fun at it because we did our own. And the, we believe the correct answer is a map of the US with the McDonald's logo 50 times. I mean, it's the most popular. Right. It's the most popular quick fast food establishment in every state. Now, if you look at most popular by chain, meaning most activity per chain, uh, then In-N-Out wins in a few of the West Coast states, including California, uh, and then Chick-fil-A seems to be the champion across the country, yeah. with a 21 in 21 out of the 50 states being. The uh, highest traffic I, per, per per business. I, I just have to step in as a uh, editor's note. I think In and Out is the biggest case of mass hypnotization that I've ever seen in my life. That place. I, it's hypnotization. Hypnotization. Yes. I, I just don't get it. Anyhow, um, uh, we've got a always in their in their long car. Their, their fries suck. Takeout lines. The, their fries suck. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've got the mic. Their fries suck. And so um, the burgers are fresh. The burgers are good. Yeah, fries. Um, in the minute we have left, uh, um, you said something really interesting uh, last year in a piece you wrote about AI that um, you felt that um, mimicking human intelligence is the bottom of the bar or bottom of the scale. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I wrote this blog post on there just seems to be a fascination around thinking about when is AI going to be just like a human? When will it take over? Um, a fascination with, in media, if you look at the movie industry, they're always thinking about the pinnacle of AI is something that looks human, can, can speak. Yep. And in, but the reality is, on the ground, is that the most interesting and important use cases of AI will be things that a human could never possibly think about doing. Uh, and so it's simply the wrong bar. If you're going to measure the progress of AI, it shouldn't be, does it look human? It should be, can it do things that would take, can, can it do things in a second that would take us days or years. Like, um, think about the new Google earbuds that can translate any one of, I don't know how many languages, in real time. I mean, it's really yeah. Star Trek 
coming to us. And, so, and then all of these industries that are being remade uh, in, with automation and big data, uh, that's really, really where the excitement is. Cool. Healthcare, well, I think, would be a terrific one to see more progress. I hear there's a company getting into that. Um, anyhow, we are out of time. Uh, Gil, thanks for, uh, thanks for your time. Great to meet you. Great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Appreciate it.